Okay. All right. I'm um, doing a veterans interview. My name is Nancy McCaffrey. It's um, November 8th. We're at Emma Clock Library, and I am interviewing Robert J. Farmer for the um, Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Hi, Robert. How are you? Good afternoon. Okay, so we'll just start. Make sure you're okay. I just the camera. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so can you just give me some regular questions here? When and where were you born? Born in April 1948, Brooklyn, New York. And um, your parents, what were their occupations? My father was a school teacher, my mother was a housewife. Okay. And do you have any siblings? I have four brothers and two sisters. Okay, and their names? My older brother is Duncan. I'm the second oldest. The next one is Thomas, John, James, Marianne, and Catherine. Okay. And did any of them, had they served in the military at all? My brother Thomas was in the Navy for six years. And that was Vietnam as well? or? Not, he wasn't in Vietnam. It was Vietnam era, though. He was oh. in the Navy the same time I was in the Army. Okay. We all left. And what were you doing before you entered service? I was in college. I was a graduate student immediately okay. before I went into the service. Okay, so you were a graduate. Okay. And what branch of military did you serve in? Uh, U.S. Army. Okay. And you were drafted? Drafted out of Bayshore, New York. Okay, so you were drafted and you were already in school, isn't that? Right. I, was, I completed one semester when I had my draft notice. That was the first year they had the lottery. My number was 90, and so I went pretty early. Mm. Okay, okay. So when you um, actually went to training camp, what was your what were your early days of training like? The early days, basic training in uh, Fort Dix in New Jersey. It was the basic uh, eight-week course where we went in, had one week of um, you know, administrative work, uh, giving us uniforms, haircuts, testing, and then following that we started the regular course of basic training. Okay. Do you recall any of your instructors and what they were like? They were, they were tough, but they were, they were fair. I mean, drill, my immediate drill sergeant, his name was Pompili, and he was a military man. He was an infantry man. He was probably, in, I think he was in the military about 17 years at that point. And he had been to Vietnam on, I think, three cycles. Oh, yeah, three, okay. three different years yeah. at that point. Good. Did you, did you, did you receive any specialized training in boot camp, or is that just boot camp? Regular everybody, general camp? everybody gets the space, basically the same training. Okay, and then from there, where did you go? From there, I went into. Uh, I was assigned to military intelligence school in Fort Hollowberg, Maryland, uh, as an intelligence analyst, and I did that for eight weeks, and then they took. They had three courses going, to one, through, one week apart each, and I was selected out of the first course to go to an advanced course, which lasted an additional 12 weeks. Okay. And upon completing the advanced course in January of 1971, I was uh, given the rank of Specialist 5, which is about eight months into the Army, which is about as fast as you could make that type of rank. Now, to be a specialist, did you have to take, you know, intelligence specialists especially, did you have to take some kind of test for them to put you in that area, or? The, when, I, when I was assigned to the intelligence school, it was after taking a battery and test the first week of basic training. Okay. All right. And how did you adapt to the military life? Did you find it hard to adapt? It was, it was different than civilian life. And once you get out of basic training, it, it was a lot softer to tell you the truth, uh, and the uh, treatment was a lot better going through schools. So did you find it hard to live in barracks and with the food and, you know? Well, I, you know, coming out of college, living in dorms, I think it, was, it wasn't quite the same, but it was sort of similar. And usually the guys, it was a lot of camaraderie, so it, it wasn't too bad. Okay. Everybody was in the same boat. So when you finally were shipped out, where did you go to? I went to uh, uh, Vietnam, and I was assigned to 24th Corps in Da Nang. Okay. And as an intelligence officer, what did you actually do? I was an enlisted man. I was a... Oh, uh, an officer. Yes. yes that's true. Intelligence analyst. 
who was the uh, my MOS as the military occupation specialist it was not titled 96 Bravo 20 and that was an order of battle analyst and we worked at Corps 204th uh, Military Intelligence Detachment and 24th Corps and we received intelligence reports a number of things it could have been uh, aerial photography spy information captured prisoner information uh, long range reconnaissance patrol information, radio intercepts. There was a whole myriad of information we would get in, and every day we would put together our daily briefing at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, usually to a colonel, sometimes a, a general would attend the briefings. And there would be different people in there from different areas. Some would be doing uh, radio intercepts, imagery interpretation, and we'd all have a, sh a chance to present the information we had. Then we'd write a weekly report, and then a monthly report, and occasionally we would do special reports for different operations or things that were happening. Okay, so it directly affected the men on the ground that were fighting, or? Yeah, based on the reports we write, then the officers and operations would use that information to direct the, the men on the ground. Okay, yes. all right. Okay. So you didn't really see combat, I guess, or casualties or anything like no, that? No, I was not in a combat unit. I was at Corps headquarters with three uh, generals there, so it was a fairly safe area. No, okay. Um, did you have a lot of, did you make a lot of friendships with that, that when you were there and then carried it through for when you came home? Or? I made friends there, but I never carried any through. No. We all lived okay. in different parts of the country and were going to different stages of our lives. But I, the people I did meet there, I still remember them vividly in my mind. And what stands out? The two in particular stand out. Well, there were a number of people in my own generation, which were very good people. One fellow was Charlie Smith, who I went through basic training in all the intelligence schools, too, at the same time, and he lived in Connecticut. And there was another fellow, Mike McCarthy, came over a couple months after I did. Uh, Jack Collins, Jack Delaney, uh, John Church was one of our group, and we had some, uh, Sergeant Torgerson came in, he was an older fellow, he was around 37 at that time, we thought was very old, <laughs> and uh, he had been in the Korean War and then in the reserves, and he volunteered for active duty, uh -huh. so he came over, and he, uh, no, he was uh, half uh, Sioux Indian and half uh, Swede, and he lived up in Minnesota, he was a very nice man, and very, uh, uh -huh. very intense. Uh, two particular people that stood out were two uh, NCOs. One was a uh, sergeant major who I got to meet uh, mainly because he played bridge and he happened to see I was playing bridge one night with a few people and he asked if he could come and join the game. He was an avid bridge player. And that turned into a number of uh, uh, games including a, we had a little club where we'd play once a week and we got up to 16, 20 people sometimes. and. Some high-ranking officers would come, some civilians maybe work for the CIA, people from the French mm -hmm. consulate in Da Nang heard about it, they came over wow. and played. So it turned into a, a little function and allowed us to use the officers club at the time to do that. But John Coleman, the uh, sergeant major, was a German national. He had graduated, he told us, from the University of Berlin with a degree in organic chemistry in 1937. His uncle tried to assassinate Hitler around that time, so he had to flee the country, came to the United States. He uh, ended up in uh, the Army uh, Chemical War uh, facility out in Colorado during the entire World War II. They didn't send him overseas, but after the war ended, they sent him over to Berlin. And then uh, he was there about three months, and they called him into an office. He was a lieutenant at that time, or first lieutenant. They told him he was going to uh, be a spy in East Germany because he was native German. So they mm -hmm. stripped all his uniforms from him, gave him all cl civilian clothing, cover stories, or identifications, and he stayed five years in East Germany as a spy mm -hmm. after the war. And he uh, told us some of this stuff, but he never told us a lot. You know, he told us some of the more interesting things about it. But these guys never talked a lot about what they did. He came back, he worked his way up, he was an officer, and he was a major in 1957 and they had a big reduction force in the military. So he could either get out or they offered him, I think, a master sergeant slot, which he then took, ended up being a sergeant major. 
and that's when I met him. And he was uh, 54 or 55, he was retiring after the war. I did meet him in New York City twice, but he did eventually move back to uh, Frankfurt, Germany. Oh, really? and, he worked, and he worked for the U.S. Army as a civilian over there for a number of years. I did correspond with him by mail for about five or six years, but I never did see him physically after the, you know, 1972 when I met him in New York City. The other interesting NCO was this uh, Sergeant First Class. He was even more interesting. His name was Alden K. Woolley. And he was born, I think, around 1918 in Connecticut. His father had an import-export business and lived in Korea. And when he was about two years old, his mother and father were divorced, so his father got custody of him and took him to live with him in Korea. And when he was six years old, his father died. So his father's Korean partner took him in and raised him with his family. Okay. He, at that time, the Japanese occupied Korea. When he went to school in Korea, he knew how to speak, read, and write both Korean, Japanese, and Chinese. Uh, when he was 16, going to school, there was a Japanese uh, soldier who was a, like a, a god at a road who directed traffic, he used to beat him up all the time, is what he told me. Mm -hmm. So his father took him, his Korean father, put him in a Buddhist monastery for two years between the ages of 16 and 18. And he learned, I think he was still a practicing Buddhist because he did have a Korean wife and a Korean a son in Korea. And um, he uh, came out at 18, he said he was much stronger then, and the same Japanese crossing guard or policeman tried to uh, beat him again, and this time he uh, beat him up pretty badly, he said. The Japanese police came, took him into prison, beat him up, knocked all his teeth out. And uh, his Korean brother uh, had to sneak into the American embassy, found the American as bastard, his wife, and told her that there was an American citizen. He was an American citizen that was in a Japanese jail. So the ambassador went over and got him out, and they deported him to the United States. He was 19 at the time, but he, he, even though he could speak Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, he didn't know English. He could not speak English. So he came to the United States as, a, as an American citizen, could not speak English. He ended up in, they put him in, he got a job in the Merchant Marine as a merchant seaman because he didn't have to speak too much English, mm -hmm. but he learned to speak English. He told me a boat was shot out of him in the Gulf of Mexico. He was on a life raft. What for, life? <laughs> yeah, on a life raft for five or six days till he was rescued. And he figured he didn't want to be on the sea anymore, so he joined the army. And he was a very tough man, even at 54, 55, he was still very uh, tough and boisterous. And um, so he joined the U.S. Army and he went through Ranger School, but he told me the toughest school he went to was actually a mule handler's school. This was during the 1940s, during World War II, which I, I found hard to believe, but he said that was even tougher than Ranger School. I think it was out in, uh, in Utah, and he said, and then he went to the Philippines, and they used mules and, for pack animals to take food and right. ammunition and supplies. And he stayed in the Army after that. He was in the Korean War. He was in Korea at the time the war broke out, so he ended up fighting at the Pusan Pocket or Pusan Perimeter, which was the only toehold the U.S. Army had at the time until MacArthur did the landing at Indochina. So he's in the Army. He, he had a number of assignments. He stayed a lot in Korea because he could, uh, he could speak the language. Mm -hmm. And I met him. He, this was his, his first time in Vietnam, it was 1971. He had been in the Army but never assigned to Vietnam, which was unusual for that time. And he came over, and I got to know him. He was in my unit, and I was, just became friendly with him. And he was more than willing to uh, tell me uh, his life story, which I found amazing. Yeah, yes. And being 22 at the time, I, you, you don't realize that these types of people just don't, you don't come across every day mm -hmm. in ordinary life. So he was, he was a very interesting man. And I, he was transferred to another unit, but at the, still within 24th Corps after a few months, but I stayed friendly with him. And I, I saw him at, uh, right before I left, said goodbye. He was going back to Korea. He was retiring. But uh, he taught me a lot, too. He taught me a lot about Oriental culture that I, you know, no one else could teach me about. And he could look at somebody and tell me if they were a Vietnamese or a Chinese or a Filipino. He, he was very good at that. I went to a couple of Korean restaurants with him in uh, Da Nang, Vietnam. He would order the food. He knew how to order the food. 
three Korean generals came in one day to the restaurant, and he went over and took me over, and he knew them all, and they knew him, and he talked to them, and they were, they were very pleasant to us. Which, so he, he was in his background, mm -hmm. he knew a lot of people. And, uh, and it was a kind of experience and a person that you, I just never came across. Right. I knew a lot of nice people, but nobody like these two had the same type of life or uh, beginnings that were precarious for them, but seemed to work out okay. But they did find a home in the U.S. Army. So did he leave Vietnam before your tour was over? No, he came about a month or two after I came in. Oh, okay. And he, I said goodbye to him. He was leaving in about a month or two later. Uh, though they were speeding up at that time. I was supposed to leave at, in a full year, but I left two weeks early. I received orders after they, uh, to uh, speed up my uh, leaving Vietnam by about two weeks short of a year at that time because they were reducing forces. Mm -hmm. So you were in from 71 to 72 in the Army, and you went to Vietnam when? I went to Vietnam in February 72, to January, uh, February 71 to January 72. So it was one tour? One tour. Okay, and you were ready to get out at that point? <laughs> right. They, they had, when I had originally gone to basic, I took the test for officers candidate school because I, had, I was a college graduate. Mm -hmm. And at that time they told me they had an excess of uh, second lieutenants and they were not accepting any more people oh, into okay. officers candidate school. When I went to leave, I was interviewed by the lieutenant colonel who ran our unit. He offered to get me a slot in office at candidate school, but at that time I, I was not in a, in a frame of mind to want to go back and do yeah. that because now you're starting all over again and it's almost like going to basic training. And, mm -hmm. uh, and to make a career at that time, probably now in the military, you had to go through a combat arms like infantry artillery, which we titled maybe going to ranger school and other things, which I really didn't want to go back and start going through that yeah. at, at that point in my life. Okay. Um, okay, so that's good. Um, what did you do besides playing bridge? What else did you do for recreation in Vietnam? We, they had a Quonset hut which had a basketball court in it, so we would play basketball. There was a exercise room that was mostly weights and mats, which I would go and uh, exercise about three days a week. Not that many fellow soldiers were doing weightlifting into, <laughs> into the exercising. Yeah. And if the weather permitted, I would do some jogging. I was a runner in high school, so I was familiar with the running. And I ran until I was about 60 uh, before nature uh, took over and told me not to. And so I would run, but uh, um, in Da Nang, it, when I went up there in, in February, it was cool. It was around 55 to 65 degrees. That was the monsoon. Mm. It was a rainy season. It didn't rain any day, like say the monsoons in India or something, places like that, but it did rain often. Then in the summer it would hover around 90 degrees uh, to 105 degrees mm -hmm. in that range, more probably closer to 100 every day. The hottest it was when I was over there was 118, which it was so hot you couldn't even put a fan on you because it would just blow yeah. hot air and you would sweat. But it didn't get up to that temperature too many days. Maybe it lasted two or three days, that kind of a heat wave. It was very humid, though, too. Very it? humid, right. That's why when you put a fan on you with that hot yeah, air, you would just it sweat. It didn't help. It didn't help. And I was through one typhoon or hurricane ahead when I was over there. Um, how did you keep in touch? Did you keep in touch with your family and your friends? Yeah, we would send, mostly send letters. There were yeah. no phone calls at that time. I think if there was an emergency, they would get you a phone call to the States. I never had to do that. But I would send letters. I wasn't a big letter writer. I'd write maybe every two or three weeks. My mother would write more often, tell me to write more. <laughs> you know, but I, I wasn't a big, and I had my brothers and sisters, I'd write to them. And, um, and, and that's basically the correspondence I did. I went to, uh, on uh, leave, I went to Australia on oh, R&R. Nice. There, there was three or four places at that time they would send us to. You could go to Hawaii, Australia, Taiwan, or Formosa, Taiwan, and I picked Australia. How was that? That oh, was beautiful. The one in September, it was going into, the, it was just coming out of there winter. So it was probably 70, 75 degrees. The people were great. They treated us very nice. I know they told us if we wanted to play golf, we could go, they told us to go to some golf course, which we went to, and they gave us golf carts, balls, clubs, oh, nice. tees. 
and they charged us 50 cents. <laughs> and it was one of the nicest wow. golf courses. It was right on the ocean, beautiful golf course. So they were, they were very nice to us over there. So were you in Sydney or? Mostly Sydney, correct. Wow. Okay. Did you ever go back after the war? I would have loved to, but I never, I never did go back. Still time. Still time, perhaps. <laughs> okay. So is there any other situation or incident in Vietnam that, that's in your, you know, well, it was, it, was, it, was, it was a little di different on real. Once we used to burn our documents at the helicopter landing area, and we'd take them, they had a big canister, we'd put them in, and usually every time we went over, somebody would shoot at us sniping, and you'd, you'd, you'd hear the bullets, thankfully, they buzzed by, it felt like almost like a bee buzz. And, uh, but we would, and then it was right on the edge of an area where displaced people were living, and they lived in these tin huts where they had corrugated tin they would pick up from other places and make cuts mm. out of them. So somebody would shoot from there. Um, we were playing a softball once down at China Beach. They had a little league, so we'd go down maybe once every week or two and play games, and they had a big area cleared out. So they must have had agent arms on, on the field, and somebody was sniping at us during the game, but we wouldn't stop the game. So it was sort of strange. Yeah, that's but it was one of, you know, <laughs> And the helicopter came out and started uh, spraying the... Uh, jungle area where they thought the sniper was, but when we continued the game. So it was a, it was a little little different. I yeah. wasn't in a, we didn't feel we were in a lot of danger, and I definitely didn't have the experience uh, the infantry soldiers had and a lot of other people yeah. they were living out in the bush. And, uh, you know, we, we, we were living basically in a lot of luxury compared yeah, to most sounds, of those guys. Yeah. Compared to the infantry or whatever. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And they, they had infantry people would come in, they had uh, Usually a platoon would come in and they'd spend two weeks and they were the guards around the camp. And during certain times uh, we would pull guard duty with them. Usually every month when the moon went down, there was some kind of probing attack. Because you, when there's no moon you don't realize it living in the New York area how dark it really mm -hmm. gets. And, and we would do that and occasionally I, I was on, uh, I would have to be sergeant of the guard, which was a 24 hour cycle where you would go around to all the stations and control the, uh, the guard. And I was assigned to what they called the reaction force. When I first got there, they said I'd be on it for six months. And every time there was a, the alarm went off, we would go to the uh, armory, pick up our weapons. We didn't have our weapons we didn't have that with us at all times, so we had access to weapons in the shop where we worked if we needed one quickly. And we would congregate there, and then they would send us to a s section of the camp where they thought possibly there would be uh, s some disturbance. Unfortunately, when I was there, there was never any uh, counterattack that we had to make or anything like that. Now you said it was 24 hours. You weren't on duty for 24, 24 hours. Yeah. 24 hours straight. Yeah, when we pulled guard duty too, we would start at night and we'd stay up all night straight, and then we'd take a shower and go to our normal duties the next day. Not not even any sleep at all. No, not usually not. Wow. But that was we didn't do it often. But the infantry guys. A lot of those guys sometimes would be up for two, three, four days if they were in a bad situation. So, you know, I think if you talk to those fellows, which I did, they were always tired. And not only were they staying awake, but they were carrying, you know, 50, 60 pound sacks on their back and, you know, cutting through a jungle and doing a lot of things like that. So I always felt, a, you know, soft spot in my heart for those guys. I felt guilty that, I, you know, and most, a lot of those guys were young. I was 22 and I was relatively old. I think the average draftee was about 19 yeah. in Vietnam. I wonder how they even functioned, you know, not getting any sleep for two or three days. Right. They functioned because they were alive. I think that when you're dead, you can't function. And that's what happens sometimes. It wasn't always like that, but a lot of, a lot of times I know they would shift guard duties two hours on or off, but uh, a lot of times, depending on what operation was going on, the guys would be awake for a couple of days. Yeah. So when what was it like on the day you were going home? You knew where you were going. It was it was it was it was bittersweet. You wanted to go home, and uh, but there uh, were younger guys coming in to replace us, which we had a couple of weeks to train, and we didn't we didn't really like felt guilty leaving the guys there. And when I left in '72, the um, there was a big uh, push going on by the North Vietnamese. When two months later they had the big attack across the whole country. 
and getting the intelligence reports, we were writing about that because we, we could pick up the buildup. Patrols were going out, they were hearing, seeing tanks and convoys in the, the northern provinces all along the ocean border. They were reporting it back to us. They were picking information up on the uh, uh, aerial photography. That, and then we were, uh, we would, they would plan bombing runs, like B-52 bombing runs, and sometimes they were, they were hitting ammo and petroleum dumps and they were getting huge secondary and tertiary explosions. Mm -hmm. So we knew there was a, a big buildup coming. And, uh, and it, did, it did in fact happen that and two months later, that's when Nixon ordered the uh, mining of Haiphong Harbor and the bombing of North, you know, Korea's was bombing of Vietnam. No, Tet was in 68. Oh, okay. And this was, they came, they, it was a full NVA attack across northern, central, and southern Vietnam towards Saigon by you no know, complete divisions at that mm -hmm. time. Big, it was a big offensive. So they, you knew that was insane. coming, but that came after you had already left? You knew it was coming. Matter of fact, I was flying home on the military jet. It was a stretched out DC-8, I believe, and I was reading Time magazine. And one of the articles in Time magazine was about Vietnam. It had basically one of the reports from some captured documents I had that was supposed to be secret in the report. So apparently somebody gave them to uh, the press to write about. Maybe they were declassified at the time. Mm -hmm. It was the same report on the documents captured outlining the battle at about eight different points and I remember writing it was in Time magazine. And that was before they even did it. That was before they did it, right. <laughs> but they, they there was was not a it was so Tet was a surprise. Uh, this was not a surprise. Uh -huh. They knew we knew it was coming even when I was still there. Okay. So um you got on the plane to come home, and where did it stop, and how did you get home? We stopped first in Japan at, uh, I think it was Yokota Air Force Base in Japan, and we were supposed to make a second stop in Hawaii and then to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, but the pilot said they had very good tailwinds and they, they flew directly to uh, Fort Lewis or whatever Air Force Base was up there in Washington, it was adjacent to Fort Lewis. And uh, from there, I believe it was Super Bowl Sunday, because we get off the plane and one of the sergeants that was on base came over and said, oh, first thing he told us what the score was, I think it was maybe Baltimore and Dallas were playing at that time, I'm not sure. It wasn't that important to me at mm. the time, but some you know, people were interested and it was nice to know. And they took us over and I think they gave us a meal and started processing us. And that was in the morning and at the end of the day there was a big thing everybody knew, they took us over, they had a special restaurant set up where if you came back from Vietnam they gave you the steak dinner and beer and, and that's what we went over to so I remember that. Yeah. Okay now was this under with, still with the army or is this? Still with the army. Oh, still I was processing army. out. I was there about two days processed out of the military. I wasn't discharged until 1976. At that time you, you your commitment even as a draftee you normally you'd stay two years active service two years in the reserve and two years in the inactive reserve. So when I came back, uh, they had a lot of people in the reserves, so they put me in the inactive reserves and I did not receive my discharge papers till 19, four years later, 1976. I did receive separation papers. Also, I came back, my two years of active duty would have been up in May. I came back in January, but I had six weeks leave built up coming and if I had come back, I would have had about two and a half months they would have had to send me. So I was given a discharge, an early discharge at that time, so they didn't have to uh, logistically find something for me to do for two and a half months. But the inactive reserves, there was no chance of them calling you up again, really. They didn't call me up. They did send me letters to ask me if I wanted to come <laughs> on reserve duty for two weeks at different places, and I just kindly said no. I was working at the time, and I just didn't want to get back into the military. Right. It, I was out and it was, it was tough to transition in and out back in at that point right. of my life. So um, you came home and how were you received by your community? I mean, I'm sure your family was The family and neighbors were all very, very good. And uh, I had neighbors next door, they were, they were older, they were in their late 60s and we were very close to them and I went over to them the first day I came home. And, Spoke to them for a couple of hours. They were, all, they were the Irvings. They were always very good to me. So did you find it hard to transition back into civilian life? No, uh, 
it, it, it wasn't hard. I did sleep a lot because I was I had been up for almost two full days straight, you no, know, good, uh, getting out of the military. I slept a little on the plane coming back from Washington State. That was about a six or seven hour flight, yeah, but I did manage to sleep probably through half of that, even though I was anxious mm -hmm. to get home. And my parents and one of my brothers picked me up at Kennedy Airport, and drove me home. And I know I went to sleep again for about six hours after that. Just uh, okay. very tired. So it was Vietnam time. Did you ever have any problems with people not liking you because you were a veteran or anything like that? I, I didn't have a, that. I didn't have any problems. You know, but we didn't go around saying we're veterans or anything like that. So people wouldn't know what your status was unless you asked. And when I went to work, there were a few fellows at my age who were in Vietnam, but not as many as I thought there would be. A lot of them didn't just learn in the military. Some of them were drafted. A lot of, a lot of people were uh, had hypertension or something, and they were physically not uh, eligible. You know, they were not accepted by the, even by the draft at that time. And I think today, I read only about 23% of all people who try to enlist were found physically fit to uh, go in the armed services. Now, when you left, before you left for Vietnam, you were in graduate school. Did you go back to graduate school? I didn't go back. I was in graduate school at the University of Kansas, and I was going to get a Ph.D. in microbiology. When I came home, I didn't want to go back to school right away, so I took a job with Suffolk County Department of Health Services, which I ended up staying there for 35 years. But I did take advantage of the GI Bill, and I got a uh, master's degree in mechanical engineering from uh, Stony Brook University, mm -hmm. and a master's degree from uh, New York Institute of Technology in uh, mm -hmm. MBA finance. Were you able to use those masters in your job, or yes, and particularly oh, the really? engineering degree. Yeah. Right, I, had, I ended up in an engineering slot and uh, became a professional engineer, licensed professional engineer, which I still am. That's great. Okay. How did the wartime experiences affect your life at all? Well, I think it puts everything in a little different perspective. I didn't let things bother me as much. Uh, people yelling didn't seem to bother me as much <laughs> after going through basic training and other things. You, you tend to look at them as, as barking dogs more than serious <laughs> yelling. And so you, you tend to let things roll off your back a little easier and not, get, not let smaller things get you excited. Okay. So you went to work for 35 years in uh, the health services. Right. Um, what kind of life lessons at all, if you learned any at all in the military service? Well, I think you, what I learned is that you meet great people no matter where you go. And you can meet some lousy people no matter where you go either, but I tend to remember all the good people I met, and that's what I try to concentrate on. And uh, it was. Uh, and I think th they taught me things, and they lived lives that I would never live, but they seemed to uh, persevere and, and do okay. And mm -hmm. so I always felt that if uh, some of these people went through tough lives and big transitions in their lives, the things I was going through were very insignificant compared to yeah. what, what to other people at. had to do. How did the military service impact your feelings about the war or the military in general? Well, I still, I, I like the military, I like the military people. A lot of people make snide comments about people in the military, and uh, I never felt that way. I felt I met a lot of good people. Even when I was in, it was unusual for somebody 22 years old to be friends with senior sergeants even. And, uh, but I uh, seemed to have no problem being friends with them, and uh, I liked their company. Okay. And so a lot of people, would, would, even in the military at that time, would, would make comments that why well, I was friendly with these older, what they called them, lifers, but that didn't seem to bother me at all. So you really got along with everyone very I, much? Well, I, yeah, some people, if they were my friends, they were my friends. It didn't matter how old they were. Okay. Do you have any messages you'd like to leave for the future generations? Well, I, I, I think uh, the biggest message I would say is that you always have to be on guard and uh, you have to be ready uh, to uh, exert power if necessary. And a lot of times in a lot of cultures, just being nice to people is taken as weakness. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you have to be nasty to people, but uh, democracy and niceness is not a universal concept, but power is. People respect power. And uh, you don't 
you don't realize that so much within the United States, but when you go to these other cultures, I think it's very, very important that you do exert some kind of power, or at least be, be ready to exert power. You don't have to be forced with them, but I think if they know you're ready to protect yourself, I think they respect that. And if you don't, I think they'll take advantage of you. Hmm. Okay. Do you have anything else that we haven't discussed that you wanted to add to your interview? Uh, well, I think overall, it was experience. If I had a choice, I wouldn't have selected going into the military. After being in there, I'd say it offered a lot of valuable lessons. I met some great people, and I uh, still have a lot of respect for the people in the military and what they have to go through. That's, that's a big job, that's for sure. Okay, so I guess we covered everything. There's, there's nothing else you want to add? And I think, no, that's uh, most, most of the major things. Most of my uh, things I went through were mundane compared to the people I was describing. And I yeah, think but you had a very important job. Okay. Yeah, we did. And we did. And uh, it, we, we tried to take it as seriously as we could. And we, we used to work at least six days a week, sometimes seven. And sometimes we'd be up at night, to, not, not only on guard duty, but filling out reports if something was happening, if there was an operation going on and information was coming in. So it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily a nine to five job. We were probably at least 10 to 12 hours a day doing work and sometimes, sometimes longer. Okay. You don't go home, you're there the whole time. Yep. I think that's the one thing you, you realize when you start working every night you go home. This was a job where you lived it 24-7. Yeah, that's true. Okay, I just want to thank you again for coming in. Well, I'm happy to have been and here. I really enjoyed talking and to you. I'm glad to at least relate to some of the interesting people, great people I know. And uh, I don't think they would talk about themselves, uh, but I'm glad I was able to at least describe uh, what, I, what I did go through and the people I met was the important thing yeah. for me. And this will be in the archives now. Great. So, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. <laughs>